certain way. But when you know that you say in Jesus in the right way, it means something. Father, thank you for the name of Jesus. Father, we pray this morning, first of all, a prayer of thanksgiving. We're thankful this morning that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, with all of my heart, I thank you. I am in awe of you. I am in awe of your mercy and your grace. And I want a greater understanding of what you've done for me. I want my gratitude to overflow. My cup of gratitude runneth over. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. The name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess is Lord. We pray your anointing upon the remainder of this service. Anoint me, O God, to speak your word. To give a word in season to your people. Open our ears that we could hear. Open our eyes that we can see through the Spirit. what we can do, what we can accomplish as people of prayer. And God, I ask for your anointing. Form my words, direct my mind, control my tongue. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I want you to open your Bible with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The Lord has really been stirring me on prayer. Because it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter what's in your bank account or what's not in your bank account. It doesn't matter how many people that you have the ear of or you don't have the ear of. In prayer, you have the ear of God. And if we believe the Bible, and we believe what the Bible says about prayer, I believe that we would be praying a whole lot more. I told my daughter the other day, we were just running an errand, and she always gets a mini-sermon on errands. And I said, you know, if we would walk close to God, not be religious, I mean, walk close to God, live in the audience of one. We would hear him talking a whole lot more than we do. I'm, telling, I'm talking about being in a restaurant and walking past somebody and God speaking something and you turning around and just speaking it right into their life. And then to feel the anointing afterwards of the presence of God. Thank you, God, that I can hear your voice. Especially when that person says, I can't believe you just said that. And you go, oh, thank you, God, that I heard your voice. But last week I talked about crossing the Rubicon to kind of give you a little background on that. The Rubicon was a river in Italy. And when the leaders, the politicians, would make you a general, let's just say that, and send you out with an army to conquer a land or to rule a certain area that they had conquered, when you came back into Italy, headed to Rome, you, as a commanding officer, had to disband your army. And you do not come back across the Rubicon as an army, and especially as the commander of an army. So you dispersed your army, you came back to Italy. And Caesar, when he went out and did his thing coming back into Italy, he did not disband his army. And he crossed the Rubicon. And he said in Latin, the die has been cast. In other words, when you crossed the Rubicon as an army, you were declaring war on Italy. You were declaring war on Rome. It was an act of treason. 
And when Caesar said, the die has been cast, and he crossed right in the middle of the Rubicon, they said he said that. The die has been cast. And Caesar went on to conquer Rome, and that's where we got the Caesars. And I talked about the crossing of the Rubicon or the die that's been cast in America. But there was die that was cast on a place called Calvary. No turning back. Things will never be the same again. When you say, ah, well, we crossed the Rubicon, things will never be the same again. When Jesus came and died on a cross and rose from the dead, nothing is the same again. Jesus hanging on the cross could have said, the die has been cast. You no longer have to live in your sins anymore. Satan no longer has power and authority over you. And when Jesus entered into hell as God, the die was cast. And he went and he ransacked the holding place of the righteous. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. And when you cross the Rubicon, you, it is a declaration of war. I look at my life, and there are many crossings of the Rubicon. Of course, the first one, spiritually, is in 1975 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I believed upon him, confessed him as my Lord and Savior, began living a new life. I was a new creature. That was the casting of the die. And then in 1980, in July, there was another crossing the Rubicon and the casting of the die when God baptized me with the Holy Spirit as a Southern Baptist preacher. And I began speaking with other tongues and shaking and weeping. And the power of God was all over me. No longer did I just uh, uh, believe in God. I knew there was a God. I believed in miracles for the first time in my life. I believed in the supernatural. I believed that everything God did in the Bible, in the New Testament, he still does today. My entire life, there was no turning back. I tried to uncast the die. As a Southern Baptist, you don't want people to know you're speaking in tongues. We didn't do that back then. More of them do it today. And so I kind of hid it and shut it in the background, and I even would not even pray in tongues. But guess what? God didn't allow me to turn back. He let the news get out. I'd already told some people, and they were telling people. After I'd stopped for about, it, about six months or so, I had stopped, because I would rather be Southern Baptist than to walk in the power of God. And then the girl that I was dating in college broke up with me because she found out I spoke in other tongues before. And God said, what are you going to do? And I had to make a decision. Was I going to cast the die and go across that river and say, I'm never going back. Things will never be the same. And when God baptized me in the Holy Spirit and I yielded to his power and his will, changing my whole, you know, denominational background, uh, all I knew was Southern Baptist. I traveled with Southern Baptist evangelists. My ministry was already set for Southern Baptist. My success was set for Southern Baptist. I was traveling with the number one evangelist in the Southern Baptist denomination. When we were doing crusades, I was giving my testimony at Coliseums, Tarrant County Convention Center in Dallas, and filled up high school gyms. I would go and give my testimony. That all ended when I said, I'm going to go with you, God. The die was cast, never been the same, in glory to God. I'd rather be in the will of God. I'd rather be driving an old broken down Volkswagen van in the will of God than an Escalade out of the will of God. Being in the will of God is the most important thing in our lives. And we don't always know. Now, I'm not here this morning to say in the very perfect will of God. That's a very difficult thing to do. But it's not beyond pursuing. But you can feel his pleasure. And when you feel God's pleasure, I call it joy. The joy of the Lord 
my definition, because nobody's ever given me a definition of what the joy of the Lord really is. It's not just laughter. The joy of the Lord is filling the pleasure of God. God is pleased with you. Whatever you were doing and you felt his presence come upon you and this joy come upon you and this peace come upon you, the joy of the Lord is your strength, that peace, that knowing I'm pleasing God, I'm bringing pleasure to God. And that happens in many ways, but we live in the audience of one. Whatever we do, we do with all of our hearts as unto the Lord. And there's one thing that we can do as believers that nobody else in this world can do. Only we as believers can disarm the powers of darkness. Only we as believers can contend with this being whose name is Satan. And he has other fallen angels. That's what they are. They're angels. They're fallen angels. We call them demons. And he has this little army, but guess what? They're outnumbered two to one. A third of the angels fell. That means two-thirds did not fall. And God gives his angels charge over us. And we possess the power to bind and to combat principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And what's going on in our world, not just our nation today, but what's going on in our world is a spiritual thing. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, I'm going to read verses 10 through 13. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, and I'm going to end with this in verse 14, stand therefore. When you do it all to stand, stand therefore. Christianity is an exclusive religion. This right here was not written to unbelievers. It is written to believers. I heard somebody was on, t on radio and, and a prominent preacher who I very much love. And they asked him the question, well, isn't Christianity exclusive? And he said, oh, no, no, it's very inclusive. Jesus died for all. I knew what he meant, but his answer was wrong. Christianity is exclusive. Truth is exclusive. If this is true... And whatever else contradicts this is a lie. Christianity is exclusive. There is no other religion like ours. It is the only religion of God. And I use the word religion because folks use that word. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. Christianity will never make sense to an unconverted person. Person. What I'm going to preach this morning will make absolute zero sense to an unconverted person. Matter of fact, they'll think that I'm crazy, that I talk to things that don't exist. And the Bible only speaks to believers, though. You can be, and we see it today, an absolute Ivy League scholar, whatever that's worth today, in my opinion. They can pick this book up. And it doesn't make sense to them. They don't understand this book. And a newborn babe in Christ can pick this book up and start reading it and understand more than a theologian at Harvard University. Because he's still trying to read it. There's theologians, you know, that are unsaved. I love a guy by the name of Eric McTaxis, and he's a Harvard graduate and just wrote a book on Martin Luther. He's the one that wrote the book on Bonhoeffer. And uh, he graduated from Harvard, I think, and 
he had a guy on one of his things that he does in New York City called Socrates in the City, and the guy was, had been accepted at Harvard or Yale as a theologian at their seminary. And Eric said, I didn't know they had any theologians there. Kind of a, a crack on him. But this book is written for believers. From Genesis to Revelation, it was written to the people of God. The Gospels, we hear about Jesus because we already believe in Jesus. You don't really get into the Gospels and really grasp it until first you're walking with God. And you can read the Gospel, it's a whole different thing. The Apostle Paul wrote to churches. He wrote to sons in the Lord. Peter wrote to believers. James wrote to fellow believers. Jude wrote to believers. John in Revelation wrote to believers, telling them of the things that were to come. This book is written to believers. Unbelievers can't do this. We've seen that where they try to cast out devils because they saw the apostles doing it, and the demons jumped all over those people. Paul, I know, but who are you? Jesus, I know, but who are you? And to truly understand this world, one must come at it with the biblical Christian perspective. The biblical worldview only makes sense to the believer. What happened in Las Vegas, Nevada, can really only be understood by a believer in Jesus Christ. When these people on TV say, boy, that was just evil, they're going to have to define to me what evil is. I know what evil is. Evil comes from Satan. They just throw the word around. Trying to figure out, what did this guy do? Why did he do what he did? Because there's a being called Satan. And if you're not under the authority of God, you're under the influence of the enemy. And according to the scriptures, the church of Jesus Christ is the only one who can combat the source of the problems of our world. Only Jesus Christ can bring peace. When the Lord instructed us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I struggled with that for years. I said, God, I, how do I pray for the peace of Jerusalem when I know in your word that they're going to be constantly come at by the devil, nations are going to come against them, they're hated by the world. And I said one day in prayer, I said, Lord, the only time there's going to be peace is when you come back. <laughs> to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I have to pray for the return of Jesus Christ. And I began praying for the peace of Jerusalem by praying for the return of Jesus. We got so many things going on in our world and in our nation. And you got the most brilliant people in the world trying to figure out how to solve these problems. They're never going to solve them because it's a problem called sin, it's a problem called man, and it's a problem called Satan. And we try to educate ourselves. I'm hearing this a lot today. If we just educate ourselves and find out why this man shot 58 people in Las Vegas, we think if we can just educate ourselves and if we can be nice enough, terrorists will like us and they'll leave us alone. No, they're going to kill you until or unless you confess their faith as your faith and denounce Jesus Christ. But one of the problems, even in our churches today, education, we think we can educate people out of sin. We think that we can put more money into the educational system and we keep putting more money in our educational system and bringing forth poor results. Now, this guy that shot all these people in Las Vegas didn't sound like a very uneducated man, very intelligent man. Intellectually, he was probably a lot smarter than I was. It wasn't because he had a lack of education and it wasn't because he had a lack of money because he was a millionaire. There's something a lot deeper than that. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. The prison system. I've preached in the prisons. I lived in 
Shreveport, Louisiana for 18 years, and I suppose I've preached in nearly every prison, not jail, every prison in the state of Louisiana except for Angola. I was scheduled to preach on death row in Angola, and they had a killing the week before I was to go, so they had a lockdown, and the crusade was canceled. But politicians and the secularists believe in our prison system. If we can just educate these people, and when they get out, they won't be, a, you know, committing crimes anymore. And so they're looking for an outward. But my goodness, we've got a billionaire in prison right now at Madoff. There are millionaires in prison. And we keep saying in the natural, and even the church says, well, if we can educate these people, they did what they did because they were illiterate. They didn't have an education. And America spends millions of dollars on sex education in our public school system. What do we have? Out of control, unwed pregnancies. And we have spent millions in giving away birth control I don't, not pills, but contraceptives. And teach them. We'll educate them. All it has done is produce more ungodly, sexually active teenagers. We have more single moms and teenage pregnancy because of sex outside of marriage. Right now, law enforcement's trying to find out why this man killed all those people. They don't want to talk about demons. They don't want to talk about evil or devil. And the sins that they cannot deal with, what used to be a sin, homosexuality, has now, we're going to say, there's so many people involved in this that it's a natural thing. And we're used to, it used to be a mental disorder. Now those that are mentally disordered are those who believe that homosexuality is a sin when the Word of God says it's a sin. I don't apologize for the word. I don't like preachers that get on television and they're asked a tough question and they act like they're apologizing for God. Well, Larry, you know, I know what the Bible says, Larry, but I, I just don't go there. Uh, I try to stay away from that. I'm embarrassed, Larry, that God said that only people that put their faith in Jesus is going to heaven. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to get up here. I, I know it doesn't sound good that the Bible says that no homosexual shall enter the kingdom of God or fornicator or adulterer or idolatry or a drunkard. I don't like getting into that. I, I'll leave that to, to God. And the Lord said, how can they hear without a preacher? We think we can encourage people enough. They can be encouraged out of sin. If we educate them on sin, they'll be... If education could do it, then the death of Jesus was in vain. Sin and the problems in our world is like... A disease, and I'm not going to use, I'm just, this is a, just a metaphor. I don't believe, I, everybody's got diseases. Now this man that uh, had all these sexual relationships in Hollywood, and everybody knew he was having them. All of a sudden, now that he got caught, it's a sexual disease. I'm a sex addict. I don't know any married couple that are not sex addicts. I'm going to go check into a clinic, and I'm going to come out free. I'm no longer going to be a sex addict. And they, it's a disease now. He has a disease. It's not, it's not rape, and it's not sexual harassment. It's workplace, something that they brought up because, you know, he's, he's given a lot of money to abortion advocates and women's rights, and so now... It's not rape or it's not this. They've got another name for it. It's kind of like we used to have global warming. You notice it's not global warming anymore. It's climate change. You can't miss it, especially if you live in West Texas. 
climate change been going on a long time in West Texas. I mean, we've, we've had snow at graduations in May. Uh, it's been 70 degrees at a football game, and you're walking into the game, and people are carrying blankets and coats. And they've got big old jugs of hot chocolate, and it's 70 degrees. A little over 70. And I've been living in Louisiana for a while now, and I'm thinking it's 70 degrees. Yeah, but by halftime. And I'm like, can't happen. <clears throat> we go to the game. Here's my mom and all of them. They got their coats and their everything, their blankets. We don't take a coat. It's 70 something degrees. Half time came, there was snow coming from everywhere. <laughs> Tanya and I had to go get in the car. They could not call it global warming, they had to call it climate change. A disease, you don't just treat the symptoms. That's what we usually do. When you take an aspirin, you're just treating the symptom. You don't take Pepto Bismol when you're diagnosed with cancer. Oh, I've got stomach cancer. I'm going to go get me a bottle of Pepto-Bismol. My stepdad loved Pepto-Bismol. I think he made up things that he thought he was sick just to take Pepto-Bismol. That's the nastiest stuff I've ever put in my mouth. I have never liked Pepto-Bismol. If I want to throw up, I'm going to go take Pepto-Bismol. My stepdad, drink it. I think Tanya is the same way. She likes it. She likes Alka-Seltzer. I don't like Alka-Seltzer. But you don't treat the symptoms expecting to eradicate the problem. That aspirin is only dealing with the pain. It's not dealing with the cause of the headache. And more so than that, if you misdiagnose a patient, they're still going to die. Even though you're treating them for something that you think is the problem. Our pastor in Shreveport, remember he was having chest problems in, you know, hurting in his chest. And so he goes and so they did all this stuff and they said, you, you need, you, you, you got some clogged arteries and, and they put in one of those balloons in his artery and blew it up and, and sent him home and he was still having the same problem. So he goes back in and they take out his gallbladder. Everything that was wrong with him was gone. And the main problem for the get-go was the gallbladder. Now, I guess they felt like that he needed some of this other stuff. But the problem was not his arteries. It was his gallbladder. If you misdiagnose somebody, they can die. If you get a diagnosis, you always want to go two or three other places and make sure they confirm it. And in America, we deal with symptoms. We don't deal with the problem. All the laws in America are laws to treat symptoms. If everybody lived according to this book, there would be no laws. Because you would love God and you would love your neighbor as you loved yourself. And there is no laws against that. And so we treat the symptoms. We keep creating more laws thinking it will stop the problem. If we just take guns out of people's hands, this will all stop. No, then they'll just go to more and more bombs. They will find a way to murder because that is in the heart of their father, Satan. And so we can't treat this like, a, like we treat our sicknesses. Take this just to relieve the, the pain in my head or my stomach ache and you still got the flu. You're trying to get rid of the flu. You're trying to get rid of the cancer. You're trying to deal with the arthritis. Alleviating the pain is really not dealing with the arthritis. I want to destroy the arthritis because if I destroy the arthritis, then the symptoms are going to go too. You've got to get to the root. And in Ephesians, he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against, against flesh and blood. 
We don't win the war by dealing with just man. You're not going to solve the problems in America just at the voting booth. If I vote the right person in, if I get this person, he's closer to my views, I'm going to do that every time. Not saying don't go vote, and I'm not saying don't get involved in the political system of your community and of your nation. But I'm saying if that's where your hope is, you're going to be sadly, sadly disappointed. Because they're men. They're not angels. That's why we have a constitution. And the Christians have put their, all their eggs in one basket thinking this man's going to change everything. No, this man's only job is to free us up as believers to take the gospel to our world so that men's hearts can be changed and their lives can be changed and they can be new creation. If the church, this is what I get, Mike, what you need, you want a bigger church, become more relevant. You got to get relevant. Get rid of the nice clothes. Put on some holy jeans. Be better if they were skinny jeans. And get you some high top tennis shoes. And maybe dye the tips of your hair. And get cool because that's relevant. Now, to the defense of some folks, I've seen them up there with skinny jeans and high-top tennis shoes and tinted hair and tattoos, which I don't like either. And I've seen them preach this, uncompromised. More so than somebody sitting up there in a three-piece suit and his hair, hair sprayed back. But what I'm saying is that that's relevant. You've got to be relevant. Your message of repentance is not relevant. Nobody wants to hear that. You need to talk to them about how to be successful. Don't talk about the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Talk about how to have a nice, happy family and how to journey together in this world. Y'all forgive me for getting in the flesh. I get so sick of that word journey. It's our journey. We Christians in the 21st century have become too modernized. We read the scriptures. We have our devotions. We put up our scripture for the day. And then we live in unbelief the rest of the day. We really don't believe the word of God. We really don't submit to the word of God. Frederick Nietzsche, the atheist, said one thing that just makes him so angry about atheists was when they lived like there was a God. They lived their life as if there was a God. I think what he said, what makes me so mad is when an atheist lives like a Christian. And I read that statement and I said, I agree, Nietzsche. I hate it when Christians who claim to be believers in God live like the devil. When they live like the world, when they live in unbelief. Much of our preaching today is pop psychology, mind control, and personal morality. And I put personal because your morality may not be my morality. And who am I to tell you that it's wrong? I'm someone that believes this book. If it's wrong for you, it's wrong for me in this book. It's not wrong for you to drink coffee and me not to drink coffee. If you want to drink coffee, that's your business. I don't see anywhere in the scripture where it says you can't do that. But there's some things in here that's absolute black and white across the board. No matter what culture you live in, where part of the world you come from, it is the same. It's the same thing. If our message to the world, they say, can exclude the cross. So we've seen it. The cross has been taken down. Why? Because it's just offensive. Ten Commandments are offensive. So now we exclude the cross, we remove sin and sinners from our messages, and we think people will become better just by living in our, here's another word for you, relevant, community. If people just community with us, 
And we go out and just community with people. Don't talk to them about Jesus. Just love them. Let them see how much fun it is to be a Christian. Yeah, until you have to follow Jesus. Then you get ridiculed, persecuted, some parts of the world. Can you imagine our messages today being preached to the Iraqi Christians that have fled? Iraq. Your problem is you're not relative, relevant enough. You're not relevant enough. Don't call him Jesus. Just use the word Allah. See where I'm going? See, man's problem. Even the Pope. The Pope has come out and said, we need all the religions to come together. If our message would remove the cross, remove the blood, and invite everybody in. I've had one preacher say, we got all sorts of people that come to our church and we just love them. They're Muslim. They've got some Buddhists. And we just love on them and we want to encourage them. What are you going to do? Encourage them all the way to hell? If we believe the Bible, we have to believe that there's a devil. We don't talk about the devil. We don't talk about hell. We don't talk about heaven. Except when somebody dies, everybody's gone to heaven. You ever notice everybody, every funeral you've ever gone to, everybody has gone to heaven and you're going, wow. Where is that in here? I was with a professional golfer on the driving range. And one of the wives of the other professional golfer was talking to me. And she was a believer and they were believers. And, and she was telling me something that was going on in their family with one of their children. And what the, little, what the girl did. She was a teenage girl. And she was telling me what she did. And I looked at her and I said, that sounds demonic to me. And she looked at me and she said, do you believe in demons? I said, of course I do. She said, tell me why. I said, because the same book that tells me about Jesus tells me about demons. If I'm going to believe in Jesus, then I have to believe in the devil and demons. And she said, that's what I think. And she yells at her husband who's hitting golf ball. Did you hear that? I won't say his name because you would know him. Did you hear that? So and so. Mike said, if you believe in Jesus, you got to believe in demons because both of them are in the Bible. And he turns and looks and goes, so he got me there. We don't even talk about demons anymore. And the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Christian preachers have turned to the ways of the world to treat the fall of man. We don't cast devils out anymore. We hire Christian psychiatrists to come into the church and try to counsel the people. Instead of realize there's an enemy there. The time will come in 2 Timothy 4, 3. says, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Either we believe this book or we don't believe this book. Either it's the word of God and it's true or it's not true. And if it's true, then we do everything that it says to do. All the wars, all the murders... All the poverty, all the suicides, abortions, homosexuality, divorces, divisions, I could go on and on, has its roots in the kingdom of darkness. Satan being the ruler. The Bible says that he is the God of this world. The fallen angel, Lucifer, is the God of this world. And the Bible says, give no place to the devil. The only way you can give no place to the devil is to submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. I hear people say, oh, just resist the devil and he'll flee. No, Re submit to God first. Submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee. Now, many preachers 
And all the ungodly will say, I can't believe you believe in a person called the devil. Most in the church today don't believe in the devil. This new generation of believers, they don't even believe in the Holy Ghost. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way. They don't believe Christianity is exclusive. They don't believe in truth. Christians, when I say live like atheists, what do you mean? I mean they speak in secular settings as if they're not going to use this. They will not say anything about the devil when asked. And the devil's okay with that. He's okay with people not believing in him. You ever seen that? The invisible man goes out and does everything and nobody knows who it is because they can't see him. The devil would just be fine with no one knowing that he exists because he can do a lot more. But he's becoming more open and more people are seeking him, wanting to invite him into his, their life and demons into their life. But the Lord says to the Christian, put on the whole armor of God. Get ready to stand. You're here as salt and light. And one of your jobs as a believer is to confront Satan. It's to bind his powers. It's to pull them down. It's to stand in the gap. Daniel was praying, and he was praying for his nation. He was repenting for his nation. And the angel showed up and said, I started 21 days ago when you first started praying. But I had to battle the prince of Persia with Michael, the archangel. And he came and he said, we heard you. We're battling in the heavenlies. Don't stop praying. I got to go back and fight. There is something going on in a world in the spirit that we don't see. A war, a battle, and there's something that God in his sovereignty has tied to it called prayer. That if we pray, we can tear down these powers. We can bind these powers. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. Our fight is with the powers of darkness. And I don't believe that the devil has an assignment on me. Personally. I believe he's got bigger fish to fry. He's got a demons assigned to me. But I want to make those demons wish <clears throat> that they could go to hell a lot quicker than they do. By in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons tremble at the sound of that name. That's why the world says we don't want you praying in Jesus' name. The devil has gone and influenced these leaders and said that's offensive. You know who it's offensive to? It's offensive to the devil. He's tired of shaking to win the war. The church must take authority over Satan in prayer. We must get into the prayer closet and let the gifts of the Spirit begin to be activated in our lives and we discern the spirits and know when we're praying or we're in a certain area what's going on. I can tell you that when I was preaching in Europe and I was traveling by car from Holland to Poland and then to the Ukraine, I didn't have to have a sign that said, you are leaving West Germany. There were no signs like that. I knew when we crossed in from West Germany to East Germany, I could feel the spirits. Now, people can say he's crazy, he's nuts, they've got that right to do that. I have no proof to show them anything that I saw. But I did know when I crossed the border. And it was like demons lurking principalities and powers over that nation. Rulers of darkness. Spiritual wickedness. And it was like they knew. Did y'all see who came in? Jesus. Why have you come? to torment us before our time. Don't cast us into hell. Put us into those pigs. And Jesus cast them into the pigs. Not a pig didn't even want demons. They committed suicide. They jumped off a cliff. 
because of the influence of demons. Folks, as believers, when we walk into an area or a room or part of city, or we're going there for a certain mission of Jesus Christ, we should visualize that these demons that have been holding the stronghold for years just noticed all, notice somebody's come into town that is bigger and badder than they are. I don't talk nice to devils. I don't bind spirits nicely. Excuse me, would you please move? They've already got me mad. The Bible says be angry and sin not. I do raise my voice. I am a passionate person. They say, won't you coach the football team? You ought to help us coach the football team. I said, guys, I'd get thrown out of every game. Referee would throw me out every game. I guarantee he looks up in the stands sometimes and said, you know, I wish I could throw that guy out now. He just hadn't pushed it far enough. I have heard of guys being thrown out of the stadium. I'm not cursing him. Just calling him a horrible ref. <laughs> if we believe this word, our job is to battle in prayer principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual weakness in heavenly places. Quit trying to deal with this by medicating it. We got little boys that are little boys in our public school system. By the way, those who's watching by Facebook Live, I do not send my kids there. This is a gratuitous commercial. Get your kids out of the public school system. But they get little boys, and they got them in a the classroom, and they get them at this 8.30. And they're there, let's just say, to 2 o'clock or 2.30. And they get rowdy, and they want to play, because that's all children want to do is play. Not just 8-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds. And these boys are just really different from girls. They are really rowdy. And especially if they see somebody outside that's playing. I used to look out there and I'd see another group out there from another class and they're playing out there football. I'm not watching the teacher anymore. I'm thinking, man, I wish I could go out there. And the teacher would just get on to me back then. You know, she might walk over there and shut the blinds. Today, they go, you know what? Your son needs some Ritalin. He's a tension deficit disorder. Attention deficit disorder is BW. Butt whipping disorder. I didn't have a attention deficit disorder. My dad took care of that. I got a report card, and I would go to the bathroom. Me and my black friend, he taught me how to ham bone. He turned me on to James Brown. And one of us would leave and go to the bathroom, and then the other one would go, and he'd be going to the bathroom. We'd hang out in the bathroom for 10, 15, 20 minutes till somebody come and got us. And we did this a lot. I was like four foot eight, and he was already six feet tall. He could dunk a basketball in the sixth grade. And so I get my report card, and my report card said Mike needs to have his kidneys checked. And I had an F in conduct. An F. I couldn't even pass conduct. My dad, if I got an F in, like, math, Get on to me and son, you need to crack down. But there's no excuse for an F in conduct. You should get an A. And I convinced my mom, please just sign the report card. Because your parent had to sign it. And I'll take it in. And mom, I promise you, there ain't going to be no F next time you get a report card. And so my mom agrees. And so she signs her name. I'm home free. My dad doesn't even have to see my report card. I did the bad thing. I set it down. And my uncle, 
was over. And he opens it up, and he doesn't see the F. He just says, Mike, I didn't know you had a kidney problem. My dad come out of his chair. Fear gripped me. And my dad said, what? And he grabs that report card, and he looks at it. I don't have to tell you the rest of the story. You know it. And yes, the next report card, I had an A+. Plus. My kidneys were healed by my father. But today they just give them some drugs. That's demonic. Drugs comes from the word pharmaceutical, the occult. Not everything that we take. But when you start messing with the mind and coming under the influence of demons and the demonic and the powers of darkness, you're dabbling in some stuff. And what we're seeing in our world is demonic influence. I think these people at times have a will. They're not demon-possessed where they can't do anything. Even the madman from Gadara said he ran after Jesus to worship him. And then the demons influenced and took over and said, Why are you here? Well, the reason that they were in front of Jesus is because the man himself had ran. There's my help. And Jesus cast the demon. He couldn't get rid of the demon. They were holding him bondage, but he still had some will. Enough to run to Jesus. And Jesus cast him out. 6,000 demons the one man had. I figured it up. It had to be three demons per pig. There were 2,000 pigs. I just wanted you to know I do have something up here. <laughs> it's real. And while we're on this earth, we need to be the ones that disrupt the powers and the plans of the enemy. And enforce the plans of God. All things work together for good to those who love God. And are called according to his purpose. Or his plans. When we pray in the name of Jesus. With faith. Not just for our needs to be met. And don't confuse this type of praying. With communion and fellowship with the Lord. It's a whole different thing. But there are. Times God calls us to spiritual warfare, and we go in to the war closet, to the war backyard, or the war truck, or whatever you go. And we let the Holy Spirit lead us, and we begin to pray against spirits that we see dominating our town, our state, our country. And I'll close with this in our world, because we had a friend that prayed for us every day. She was a Jewish lady that had been in the concentration camps in Germany as a little girl. And she got out, praise God, became a Christian and a prayer warrior. She prayed. And I mean, when Inga prayed, pray for me, that's what I would say. And man, she began to pray, then she began to pray under the gifts of the Spirit and discerning of spirits. And the first time she ever met me, I was at the church and somebody grabbed me and pulled me into the women's prayer meeting. That can be dangerous. And they pulled me in there and they said, Inga, pray for him. That's all they said. And she begins praying and she says, I see a sword. And I see a snake wrapped around that sword. And we need to come against that snake. And she said, the sword is the word of God. And she didn't know I was a preacher. I was an evangelist. And she began praying that the word would not be held and suffocated by the serpent. And from that day forward, and we got to know Inga, and we'd have her over to our house to eat, and she would not eat. She would pray. Tanya and I and her husband would eat. Inga would pray. And then after we got through eating, we would go and we would pray with Inga. 
And one day she said to me, Mike, God has promoted me. I said, what do you mean? And she said, he's told me now that I'm to pray for the nations. But I will always pray for you and your family. But God has promoted me to the nations. And she just knew a realm of prayer. It didn't make her any more special in God's eyes than me. It made her more dangerous to the devil than I was. But God didn't look and say, you know, looky here, Mike. That's why I, I like her more. No, God doesn't have favorites. But he is favoritism when it comes to faith. Faith is what moves God. He doesn't say, well, I just, she just does more. She spends eight hours a day in prayer. Mike, you hadn't even touched eight hours a day in prayer. No, that was what she did. And that's her place. And some can't spend eight hours a day in prayer. But all of us can spend time in prayer. And whatever time it is, let it be productive. Don't let it be a waste. Don't sit there and moan and groan and just cry and weep because you want to cry and weep thinking you've prayed. No, no, no. Get the mind of God and pray specific. You're praying for something right now. There is demonic power influencing and what we want is the Holy Spirit to go in there. And God has set up in his sovereignty prayer because we're the ones that invite God into the scene. That's how he set it up, through free will. If you're praying for loved ones, you need to find out what power has influence over their life and begin also contending with that power, that their ears would be unstopped, their eyes would be opened, that they would see. There are demons that clog up ears. There are demons that blind eyes spiritually. Larry King says he wished he could believe. He wants to believe. The devil has blinded his eyes and stopped his ear. And he's a Jew. And so I encourage you this morning. This is not a, here's the pattern of it. Go and pray and know that God has given you power. In the name of Jesus. Not in your own name, your own power, your own strength, but in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus and by the victory at the cross, I confront the enemy. And that name of Jesus works against Satan and that name of Jesus works before the throne of God. When you're praying for a healing or a need and you go to the Father, you're going in the name of Jesus. That opens a lot of doors, I tell you. Father, in Jesus' name, stir our hearts, O oh God. The only way we can learn how to pray is to pray. We can listen to people and begin to model it. And that's our starting point. But then you in us begin to perfect it and show us how to pray more accurately, not long, not how many words we put together, but the faith in the name of Jesus against whatever we're praying that's evil, that's disruptive, that's murderous, that's dividing. We can trace it. We can trace it with nationalities and cultures. We can see it wherever that culture is in all the world. They have this spirit that's just tormenting them, driving them. Help us to see it, Lord, and to begin to cast it down, to pray against it, to curse it, to render it powerless, declare the lordship of Jesus Christ, and to live the life of a Christian and to believe your word. And oh, we get angry at people in the flesh and blood, but we're not to sin against them in that anger. God, help us to see that the root of that what we see is what we can't see. It's an enemy whose leader is Satan himself. May we not fear, because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. 
God, may our faith be in you and in your power. And we thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit that is here on this earth, living in us, guiding us, teaching us, showing us. Oh, God, I pray that you be, become more real to us than any, any other time in our life. That we would see Jesus and that we would take this power and this message to our world, to our world, the post office, the bank, the grocery store, the gas station. That's our world. Where will we go? Give us boldness and discernment and courage and humility and love and compassion and patience. May the fruit of the Spirit accompany the gifts of the Spirit. And may the gifts of the Spirit accompany the fruit of the Spirit. For your glory, and I declare Jesus Christ Lord over these United States of America. In Jesus' name, amen.